gentlemen, Django Fett was one of the best characters to come out of Episode 2, Attack of the Clones. In fact, he was one of the few interesting characters in the prequel trilogy in general. He gave us a backstory for Boba Fett, and he actually allowed the Mandalorians to be expanded from just a guy in armor to an entire third faction in the Star Wars universe. And of course, he got one of the best games in the Star Wars gaming library. Today, we are going to take a look at the sadly obscure game that is Star Wars Bounty Hunter. Star Wars Bounty Hunter was released in 2002 and was developed by LucasArts and published by LucasArts, but only for two consoles, the Nintendo GameCube and the PlayStation 2. I personally didn't learn of Bounty Hunter's existence until 2004, and at that time I had the Xbox Zero One, and thus I had to wait until 2006 to finally play the bloody thing. I find it rather odd that it didn't have an Xbox port. Just about every Star Wars game at this time received one, and it makes little sense that it did not. Star Wars Bounty Hunter's gameplay is that of a Jango Fett simulator. And that is what makes this game so unique. In most games that try to adapt certain characters, they nerf that character horribly. Batman usually escapes this, but characters like Superman get all their skills taken away and they're made weaker than the weakest enemy. With Bounty Hunter, you are pure, unadulterated Django. Ostensibly, the game is a third person behind the back shooter with a lock-on mechanic that works only when Django wills it. Thus making some of the gameplay a bit finicky, as Django shoots wherever he bloody well pleases. Sometimes he'll shoot at a distant enemy, and sometimes he'll shoot at a close-in enemy. It really is random as to just where he's going to bloody well shoot. And if you want to manually target an enemy, you have to come to a complete stop and enter a first-person view that has inverted controls. First-person mode is rather finicky and rather clunky to control, but thankfully it's not used altogether that much throughout the game. This game loves to throw hordes of enemies at you at any one time. This should be fun, but it gets rather tiresome after a while, as you can never fully clear a bloody room. Django is primarily armed with his Westar 34s, and they do good damage against all foes, but this makes the game rather tedious, as pretty much every battle will be the exact same. Tap the fire button until everything dies. He is also armed with some incidental weapons, such as a blaster rifle, heavy blaster rifle, and a half-useless grenade launcher. The blaster rifles work well when they appear and are best saved for bosses. The grenade launcher works well enough, but it has an extremely shallow firing arc that makes it almost as dangerous to you as the enemy. Django also gets a sniping rifle and it works rather well here and there, but it is rarely used, and when you actually use it, make sure you're not going to get drilled by close-in enemies. Like in the horrid Attack of the Clones film, Django gets his Kamino Saber Dart. He only gets a couple of them at any one time, and they are one-hit kills, so use them wisely. You can also beat the crap out of enemies as well, but yeah, don't bring a fist to a light fight. Would you believe that in Bounty Hunter you can actually hunt bounties? <laughs> Oh my god! Well, it seems obvious, many games that feature a famous character often do not let said character do what he does best. But in Bounty Hunter, you can hunt actual bounties for actual credits that allow you to unlock bonus material. The bounty hunting mechanic is a cool concept that suffers from rather poor execution. In order to scan an enemy for a bounty, you have to equip the scanner, which means you have to plant your feet, meaning everyone and everything will start shooting you, find the enemy, scan him, mark him, and then equip the space lasso, space lasso him, and then press another button to finally capture the bastard. So yeah, it's great that it is here, but actually capturing bounties is much easier said than done. In addition to shooting, the game features a great deal of platforming and the levels have been excellently designed and at times almost feel like Raven software levels, in so much as you never walk from point A to point B. In the first level, you have to get past this locked door. You don't find a key or shoot a panel. 
Instead, you have to shoot this monster here, make said monster crowd in pain, and then the door will open when said monster's owner comes out to see what the commotion is. And the game is pretty much like that all throughout, and is quite fun for it. The game also makes great use of the jetpack and features a great many platforming challenges that can see you blow through all of your... continues? Come on, LucasArts, it was 2002, not 1992. The game does have intra-level checkpoints, and they are in convenient areas most of the time, but the continue system was rather ill thought out. This game is tough, as is any good LucasArts game, but a bit too tough to limit you to only five deaths. This system ensured that I cheated to actually complete the game, and like any good LucasArts game, the cheat codes are filled to the brim with Star Wars references, most notably the Unlock All cheat. My favorite cheat, by the way, and that cheat is known as the Mandalorian Way. Although, this is not entirely accurate, and it's kind of funny, because in all reality, true Mandalorians do not cheat, but instead act honorably. Sweet! The Death Watch accepted my application! Graphically, the game has aged gracefully, Django himself is well detailed, and the levels still look excellent as well. And the whole game is an example of the graphics plateau. Sure, a modern game might look a little better, but this game is still quite impressive to modern eyes. Animations are good as well, and Django moves quite fluidly. This game is being played on the PCSX2 emulator, and as you can see, this game runs quite well on it. There are a few minor graphical glitches here and there, but the game runs almost perfectly, and there is a little slowdown to be found throughout the game, and the cutscenes display perfectly. Throughout 80% of the game, I had 60 FPS. With a few more specific graphical tweaks, you should likely get this game running 100%. The camera is decent enough. It will generally point where it needs to, but there are times when it will point at a wall, and it will change on its own when you need to see a certain ledge or you need to jump to another ledge. This works, but sometimes it can get you killed by disorienting you. The controls for the PS2 version are pretty good and you never need two bloody hands to get it working, but sometimes it can be a little confusing, such as jumping to another ledge. Instead of holding in the direction you want to jump, you just tap the button. It works, but it's different from what one is generally used to. Music for the game is the standard excellent Star Wars score, but it's actually been arranged quite transcendently, groin-grabbingly I should say, and makes heavy use of the Confederacy of Independent Systems theme. Voice acting ranges from amazing to standard. There is no bad voice acting to be found in the game, but compared to the excellent voice actor for Django Fett, some of the actors and actresses are a bit lacking. Django, of course, has the best voice acting of all, but a close second is the voice acting of his Toydarian partner, Roz. Her voice actor turns in an excellent TV show level performance. Clancy Brown voices the side villain, Mondross. And he hams it up excellently, and is a very entertaining villain, and does a good job being the Mando equivalent to the Joker. And you can actually buy him getting away with trash-talking Django Fett. As you'd expect from a game from 2002, there is a metric crap ton of ancillary content to be found. And it is all 100% unlockable in the game. The two most notable unlockable pieces of content are the Open Seasons comic and the comedic machinima. The comic, Open Seasons, is one of the best Star Wars comics in general and has high quality writing and absolutely stunning visuals. Despite it being in the game, I bought the trade paperback anyway as I didn't want it to be tied to the game. Next, we have the machinimas. These are little behind-the-scenes clips that act as a gag reel of sorts for the game and are quite hilarious, especially the last one you unlock. I won't spoil it, but it was quite on the nose in 2002 and still quite on the nose today. What's my motivation indeed? You can also unlock cards from the Star Wars collectible card game that no one cared about then and no one cares about now. LucasArts always strove to deliver an excellent story, and Bounty Hunter is no exception. First, we got that sweet LucasArts logo, and this is one of the best by far. 
we have Django flying in and space lassoing the gold man and replacing him atop the LucasArts logo. This goes to show you the level of creativity that existed in 2002. The story follows Django Fett as he is put to the test by Count Dooku in order to determine if he is good enough to be the clone template. And in order to test the mighty bounty hunter's prowess, Dooku pits him against Komari Vosa, a wannabe Sith Lord that moonlights as a drug dealer selling space meth, aka death sticks. The game shows that Django is a bit more complex than he might first appear, and he really is just a simple man making his way through the universe. Or is he? The game tries and succeeds in making Django likable and sympathetic. The comics do as well, however you need to remember that Django is a true neutral character. He is a bad guy, but he is not a bad guy. Shut the hell up Zangief, you never were a villain, not even in the movie! Despite not being bad guy, Django is still pretty bad. He slaughters everything, and I mean everything in his path. Sure, most are bad guys, but some of them would be considered good. He slaughters some Senate cops by the bloody pallet load. He is more or less what Dick Riddick should have been. Django is not just hero classic with tats. And lest we forget that no matter how good Django can be, he still plants a bomb on Senator Amidala's ship like he was the bloody space Taliban. So he is not that nice of a guy. The game begins appropriately enough with Django hunting a bounty. He gets his jetpack knocked off and you take control right when Django must face a giant lizard monster. The battle is easy enough and works as a superlative hook for the player as it shows off just how powerful Django can be. The hunt for Kamari Vosa takes place throughout the entire game and you must first tease out just where she is and you take down higher and higher level minions as you go along. The game also shows where Django got his ship, Slave 1, and the game also shows how Django met Zam Wessel. Zam and Django's relationship is interesting, and all the other media they are shown as close, if you get my meaning. In Attack of the Clones, it's shown as anything but, and her death, spoiler alert, in that film is shown as being something easily done. With how close they get in this game and in the Boba Fett novels, it seems rather odd that Django would just saber dart her ass, even if he wanted to preserve Opsec. The villain, Montross, will show up here and there and taunt Django, and you get into a couple of mini boss fights as well. And he is a fun villain to fight, as Clancy Brown really brings his A game. One of the coolest characters in the game is Roz. Django's Cortana for the game. She gives him his various objectives and gives him information on his bounties. She is always trying to tell him to move on from his bounty hunting ways and really shows that Django is not necessarily a psychopathic killer, but just a man who is trying to make his way through the galaxy. This game story is quite good, but it is spoiled by the fact that we know that Django dies in the Attack of the Clones film. And while it was a good death at the hands of Master Jackson, it leaves one feeling kind of disappointed because even though Django is a right bastard, he is our bastard and we want to see him survive, damn it! Alas, he does not. And alas, we never received a sequel. And I have no idea why. Bounty Hunter set out to be the best bloody Django Fett game it could be and succeeded. Any issues that cropped up in this game could have been ironed out in a second game and a Boba Fett game would have been amazing. You could have an even better story because we wouldn't know the manner by which Boba Fett dies. You could even have the Fettmeister himself rescue Han and reprise the famous line from Empire Strikes Back. The possibilities were endless. Star Wars Bounty Hunter is without a doubt a legendary game, and it is also the epitome of the unsung game, and I cannot recommend it enough. And so, I am General Lutz, wishing you good Rogue Squadron 2, and good Jedi Knight 2, whatever makes you happy. <laughs> If you enjoyed this video, please consider subscribing, and if you can, please consider supporting me on Patreon so that I can continue bringing you this awesome content.